But and that was hi uh, everybody good afternoon was to get that free um, trip. my name is Ophelia what or tribal members have been asked to I come am a at at events events tribal member only to have their I honorarium currently uh, living down until here the Supai. host was brought down um, to Supai I wanted to say I'm broadcasting academically <laughs> the Havasupai Supai have been screwed um, over when ASU and, used our blood um, for other tests without our informed I'm a consent. 35 year old creating a rift female. between between the Havasupai and, and the um, outside world forever. When you are Supai so, and are able um, to find an organization that's a little that you can introduction. trust, I probably or individuals could have been better, but in organizations that you can trust, um, I, like I to wanted stick with to them. kind of give I trust a warning. Them. They treat um, me well. For those, uh, they I'm offer an honorarium without me ever um, having to ask. Speaking about I've always felt like a call and emotional topics. and not someone put so on if a pedestal should need as one of the last surviving Havasupai stepping people away who live at the bottom of the canyon or a um, member of a dying well. race. And thank you. For, thank you to the Museum of know, Northern Arizona uh, up. for always giving um, my me opinions a safe are my space. own. And to get represent the all of my tribe as a whole, and very but firmly I am tell a people woman the with truth, her own mind, the heart truth, and desire that they do not know. I speak up and, and have always spoken up, <laughs> even before so I, I am knew sorry I was a I am on repeat. woman. The formation this is not of history words that they taught to create you at school, a moment spoken so this beautifully, is not history that they or to convey a meaning. A message. This or is not the history that that the state of Arizona allows and you it's to captivated my school. life. And, and only in hindsight, we have can to I rely all the benefits on nonprofit organizations and their words. goodwill to teach words and are provide those opportunities and by expressing to be ourselves by individuals and families. It is something I've to been trying to teach myself. My so whole here life. I am. And maybe one so, day you can tell me why am I speaking here? Why today? you have asked me to speak? I'm at speaking your event. here today because we so please have a supai. Thank are you so and welcome and far to this safe space that when given the, the opportunity to Arizona. speak about the true history, I'm currently and living and have been living of my Havasupai ancestors. March 13, our Havasupai ancestors. At that time, it's really I was something to consider. tribal council. And the what also of needs to be considered became is real. the current and past exploitation were going by, of Havasupai And for the people. first time, I we was are a very small Supai tribe without about 400 in and out at tribal members leisure. that have permanent residency Every time I would go at the bottom outside, of the canyon, I saw the towering and yet red we may be of the that richest protect the village. people around the world. It felt like they were because looking we out live for me. at the bottom of the Grand They were canyon. speaking to me in a place described they were reminding as paradise. Me that we have lived here. Please know since that time people time apply memorial, for jobs to the tribe telling me just this to is get what a free it means trip to into the village to interview. We are the water. We are the rocks. We are the landscape. We are the air that surrounds us. We are the animals. This is Supai. This is who we are. This is who we have been. And this is who we will always be. Every day, this was happening to me. And you know, I felt a change. I felt like I was beginning to change. My mindset was wondering, who's going to keep fighting the good fight when I'm an old lady? <laughs> what is going to happen to Supai? Who's going to take my place? You know, <laughs> kids, they're cute. <laughs> and maybe it's easy to say that because I don't have have any of my own, but I could swear that these supai children in the village, they were just getting cuter by the day. And suddenly I realized that my body and my mind, me, I was wanting a child, a supai baby, another tribal member to strengthen the future of Havasupai people, to carry on into the future. I was realizing how important and sacred Havasupai women are. It is us. Women are the ones who will be carrying Havasupai into the future. Our children that we bear, they are the future. 
this was really sinking in for me. This concept had never really taken root within myself until now. Being a woman is something <laughs> I've had to grow into <laughs> un unwillingly at, at times. On June 25th, I found out I was pregnant and I thought to myself, well, that's pretty cool. The symptoms weren't so cool. <laughs> it was also a little scary because I had to leave the canyon for my checkup in August. At that ultrasound, the baby had no heartbeat and I still didn't really think anything of it until the doctor came in and you know, literally told me to my face, broke the news to me. And that was a sad day for me. I went through the motions to do what I had to do at home. But five days later, I was getting worse. I wasn't getting better. It was strange. And the nurse said it sounded like it was still within the scope of known side effects and gave me some symptoms to look out for. Well, a couple days later, I uh, knocked on my dad's bedroom door at 2 a.m. and he drove me to the ER and I was borderline sepsis and they had to perform a DNC. I was delirious and spent what felt like three days at the hospital with three different intravenous antibiotics rolling through my body. If it was not for modern medicine, I wouldn't be speaking before you today. I was cleared to come home and I came back and I went through the whole quarantine process. You know, I was out of quarantine for maybe nine days uh, when the bleeding started. It was everything that you see in the movies, but way more blood. It was late at night and the doctor here at the clinic told me I was having a miscarriage again. They flew me out of the canyon in a medevac when all I wanted to be was this just small, small. <laughs> you know, I just, I just wanted to be small. But instead, here was a big scene with a medevac flying in the middle of the night, getting strapped in. It felt like a huge spectacle <laughs> and it seriously sucked. The whole experience, this was happening to me again. I lost another baby twice in 60 days. What in the world was happening to me? It was really hard to deal with. I was super depressed, not myself. I didn't want to do much of anything. What a big surprise. You never know how grief is going to pop up or where it's going to pop up. I really felt like I was under a huge avalanche. And I think I might still be under that avalanche some days. So I, I chose not to run for counsel and try to focus on my well being and my health. Losing wanted children is really tough. You lose the life you were preparing for. You lose yourself, you lose your partner, and you hope one day that you can get those back, hopefully. I'm sharing with you my personal story of loss. Loss and many concepts like it are hard to convey with words because it's an overwhelming emotion. It's usually indescribable by words. In 1919, the last Havasupai elder was forced to leave Indian Garden 
Billy Burrow. He gardened at that spring and he would share those crops with the Supais who lived at Supai camp. He made Bright Angel Trail. Our great, great relative was heartbroken, beaten down. He wept. The rangers had to go down to Indian Garden. They beat him up. They put him on a mule and they rode him out of his home. How could anyone be so heartless? They made him homeless. The grief I've experienced, that was Billy's grief for the loss of his home. And he died that same year of a broken heart. The Havasupai have dealt with unsurmountable loss at the hands of the colonizer for over 140 years. Land and territories we grew up with, places we would live, hunt, gather, or travel were taken from us. Claimed and used in ways we could have only dreamt about. We were assigned a 518 acre reservation in 1882 and told we could not leave. This reservation where I am now in Supai Village, this was not our only home. It was only our summer home. It was only our home for half of the year. We traveled up to the plateau and lived in scattered family groups in the area of Grand Canyon National Park. This was devastating. The first train made it to Grand Canyon in 1903. Fred Harvey and Santa Fe Railroad started hiring supais to work for them. They put in a huge amount of work doing stonework, trail work, anything. Santa Fe Railway created a work camp for the Supai and designated land there for them to live. And today it is known as Supai Camp. But, you know, Supais weren't good for business. In 1919, the National Park was created. The Park Service started actively removing Supais. But because Santa Fe Railway had created Supai Camp, they couldn't get rid of Supai Camp like they wanted to. I never thought I'd be thanking Santa Fe Railway, but this was something on our side. But it didn't stop the Park Service from trying to implement Manifest Destiny on their own and get the Supai out of the Grand Canyon. The Park Service has it in their records, the burning of all cabins at Supai Camp in the 30s. The story goes, once the cabins were burnt to the ground, it was winter. The Park Service took all the Supais in a wagon train to the edge of the canyon where we have a traditional trail and were told to walk back to Supai Village where I'm at right now. That is a 17 mile trail. We don't know what time of day it was. We don't know if everyone survived. In the 70s, the Park Service shut down all the water and sewer to Supai Camp, trying to drive them out again. The Havasupai were experiencing loss. This was a type of loss. Regionally, I want to move south to the area around Red Butte and an area called Kumduvia. You know, that area in the 70s, the Forest Service was asking the tribe 
to point out the land that was important to the tribe. Hmm, probably to Robert Euler, who was an archeologist. And we did, and we showed them. We pointed out all the pottery sherds, the healing stones, the grinding stones in that area and over by the airport that's over there. They asked and the tribe let them know. They let the Forest Service know and Energy Fuels know that that area should not be disturbed, but they built a uranium mine right on top of it regardless. The canyon, she is our grandmother. The Supai are her children. She gave us life. She protects us. She provides what she can for us to live and take care of ourselves. We must protect her. We have been protecting her. The Havasupai are the protectors of the canyon. Losing the land was hard. With that came the loss of a lot of our life ways. Boarding schools took us away from our language and culture. The colonizers moved in and forced us to learn English, forced us to be Christian. We forgot how to be parents because the Indian agents, the teachers, the priests beat the living shit out of us. In order to make it all stop, wouldn't you give in? I'd like to take a moment of silence for all the Havasupai who lost their lives for disobeying the colonizer, for crossing that imaginary border, for drinking at that mud tank, for running away, lost in a foreign area searching for home. This is for them. And yeah. The Havasupai are still here today. Things are no longer so violent with the colonizer, but their institutions, their laws, their schools are riddled with institutionalized discrimination. And this year we had the opportunity to see other groups of people protesting in the streets because of these very same discriminations. <laughs> Even during the COVID pandemic, that's, that's a lot of fuel. That's a lot of emotion. I think that a lot of us have been worried uh, about COVID and for that much rage and wrong to be out there for people to be hitting the streets to protest change is really saying a lot about these institutions. The Havasupai have been working hard to try and change some of these disparities. We've been able to adapt. We've been able to kind of use information from the education institution, learn how to implement and use that knowledge to try to make change, to try to better our lives, to try to be better people. And it's been successful. Uh, we are successful, the Havasupai are successful. One of those successes, um, we have a holiday, January 3rd, 1975 is land day. It's a tribal holiday for us. It's a day of great victory. Uh, victory was achieved when PL 93620 was signed into law 
the Grand Canyon Enlargement Act. And we received back 185,000 acres of our own land, but 75,000 acres of that. You know, I'm gonna state it this way. It's only considered traditional use land because it's inside of the Grand Canyon National Park. That's 75,000 acres that should be in our full possession. And this is the government's version of trying to play nice. And I, I am, I am thankful that we got some land back, but it does not equal the land that was rightfully ours. It does not equal the land that we used to live freely on. It does not equal that land by the slightest. This was a many year battle with the government. Um, our lawyers work tirelessly, our advocates work tire tirelessly, our friends, our colleagues, our comrades, our community worked tirelessly on this bill with Arizona legislatures. Um, you know, something agreeable. Maybe I should call it a negotiation. Um, you know, because I'm still referencing the fact that it does not equal the land that we've lost, loss, that we grieved for, that a whole community of people grieved for. And that is the reason that I wanted to share my personal loss with you, because I think it's as close as I can get to try to convey the loss that was experienced by the community at large. It's a great loss. And losing your parents or a loved one to someone in your life is also a great loss. And it's the only thing it's the closest that I could get to try to convey that for you. And over the years, that pain and that anger, it was fuel. It was used. It was used by those community members, those Havasupai people, those leaders who were able to work and fight and, you know, I don't wanna say fighting with the government and I don't necessarily mean anarchy <laughs> or, or, or death when I'm saying fighting, but it was a huge task and you have to fight for what you believe in. And those community members did and they got back that land, 185,000 acres. Um, there was an elder, uh, Ethel Jack, Ufma, who had dreams about Washington, D.C. when she was a child. She survived a bad fever and she had visions. And she also helped get the land back. And those community members for years would travel to Washington, D.C even lived there for some months um, and come back. And it was going back and forth for, you know, nearly five years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the story goes that when Ethel Jack made it to Washington, DC, she said, you know, that building right there, that, that building wasn't in my dream, but everything else was. This Havasupai woman put her heart and soul into getting this land back, and so did many, many others. Um, but it was almost like a, it was almost like a, a fulfillment of that, of that vision, of that need, of that want, of that fight. Uh, so January 3rd, 1975, 
PL 93620. That was a very, it's a holiday. We turned it into a holiday. <laughs> so around New Year's, you know, that's like a holiday too. So it like seems like we're off of work for almost a whole week sometimes down here because we also um, take the time off for land day. <laughs> so sometimes I feel lazy around that time, but <laughs> there was a lot of hard work that went into it. And I am very blessed and respect um, all the people who worked hard and diligently on that. Um, it was almost the right timing. Um, I believe uh, Reagan was getting in trouble with Watergate and was pretty much willing to do almost anything to not be impeached. And the Arizona legislators at the time, they had his ear. And it was just perfect timing. And um, he listened to the Arizona legislators who were also helping the Havasupai uh, fight for that land back. And that is a very good example of adversity or adapting and being able to use the education um, for our benefit, um, not just feeling like everything's happening to me or, or feeling, you know, that, that was a victory. It was a huge victory. And um, uh, I just wanted to share that um, to also let you know um, that we keep fighting and there are good things that happen because we fight for them. Today, the Havasupai have a relationship with the National Park Service, a working relationship with the National Park Service. We had to learn to work with them. They had to learn to work with us. Um, thank goodness for time and change. Um, you know, I no longer have to be in fear of an Indian agent tying me to a tree because I didn't do what he said. And those days are, are, are gone physically, but still we have to deal with the institutionalized discrimination, those rules and I don't know if I want to call them regulations, but sometimes they can be regulations. They were, you know, they were meant to oppress us. They were meant to do that. And to be able to come to a point where we're able to have a working relationship with the park is, is really, um, I'm going to be a young, younging is really cool, is <laughs> really awesome. Um, and, and from that, we can also see how far that we've come. And it's not a perfect relationship. Um, sometimes the rangers um, try to write you tickets for picking pinions in the park. And, you know, we've had to have meetings with the park to remind them that this is our traditional use land. Um, you can't be doing that to us. And it's mostly new rangers. And maybe it's not a part of their orientation. <laughs> Why would it be? But it should be <laughs> if it's not. But um, that was their excuse of sorts um, that the new rangers didn't know. But, you know, we had to call them. We had to find out what's going on. We heard that you're ticketing some of our tribal members. Um, and we had to, and we step up and, um, ask and have to remind them and try to work with them. What can be done better? Can you add this into your ranger orientation training, whatever it happens to be? Um, can you, um, can the head ranger, um, put out a memo, um, reminding the rangers, not to be ticketing us uh, for picking pinions in the national park um, or um, the national park will call us and um, the last um, the last time I can remember them calling 
actually there's a couple, but I'm gonna use this example. Um, they were calling about um, Havasupai um, not wanting river runners to come up to Beaver Falls um, because of COVID. Um, we're still on lockdown, by the way. But because of COVID, you know, we needed to protect our children and we needed to protect our elders at every cost. And um, the Havasupai have made, you know, maybe it might seem like drastic decisions, but it's for the safety of the community and the safety of our knowledge keepers, the elders. And, and the tribe's gone through loss. We've experienced it. Um, COVID is a really large pandemic um, and maybe it might sometimes seem in the media that um, people don't know what to do or what do we need to do next um, but the Havasupai have dealt with loss we've known how to deal with loss and we have not let tourists in down here in the village um, since the end of March and we had asked uh, river runners not to come up to Beaver and the National Park had heard of that. They caught wind of that um, from, from the river runners. And of course, <laughs> it, it's okay, these are my opinions. And of course, some river runners were like, what, that's our river. What, why can't we go up to Beaver Falls? Like, how dare they shut us out? How, how, how dare they tell us that we can't enter? And they made a big stink about it. Um, you know, those mean ones, and they got a hold of the park. And so the park called us and was pretty much asking, is this true? <laughs> and, um, you know, there was some sort of miscommunication that happened because the National Park actually um, put out a press release that told river runners it was okay to go up to Beaver. Uh, there's a miscommunication somewhere. <laughs> oh my, did my blood boil fast. And, you know, it's because the river runner got in contact with me and I was letting them know that, no, we don't want people to go up to Beaver. And then I called up the tribal liaison for Grand Canyon National Park and was just like, what are you doing? What did you do? Why did you print this? This is not what we said. We, I need, we need you to correct this now. And, um, you know, there had to be like a big conference call and people thought they were being undermined, but the safety of the community had to come first. And I have a bachelor's in public relations. I know that that press release can be re-released. It could be fixed and that the park service could apologize for that. And that's exactly how I was on the phone and it all changed and they did reissue, they did reissue that press release and thank goodness. And hopefully those people who thought they were undermined are over it by now, they should be. And I don't really care because Oh my goodness, that just, my blood got, was really boiling. But you know what? That's an example of a situation, right? And then there was a miscommunication, but because we have a working relationship with the park, it, it can be corrected. Don't just let that press release stay out there as is letting river runners know and think that they can come up to Beaver Falls, fix it. And they did, and I'm very thankful for that. And it just really, really got me going. So I, I knew, I knew that they could change it, you know, and I know that the park wants to create goodwill for themselves. And I know that the park wants to have a good relationship with the Supai because that's how it's been lately. And even when things get bad, right, with that press release, it was, it was fixed within 48 hours. Uh, maybe it could have happened faster, but that's that's life so I can I can be very thankful um, that that situation was able to be rectified um, and I hope that I was able to convey with that example because I just kind of you know pulled it out and started talking about it that that does convey um, how far we've come 
So here we are in a COVID pandemic and we've had zero cases down here in the village. Because of those drastic measures, we're still on lockdown and there are strict procedures and protocols for anyone who gets flown out, right? There's quarantine, there's things that we have to follow and the tribe's been COVID free, still is COVID free. Um, and um, that's very exciting for us. Maybe it's exciting to you. Um, it's not like I'm researching on the internet how many places are COVID free. I don't know. I don't know if we're the only ones. I would think that we're not the only ones, but these are drastic measures that had to be taken, taken for the safety of the children and the elders. And, and it paid off. And I think it took over a year for people to stop being antsy and, and wanting to leave, you know, feeling like they're trapped down here. It was just different. And with that lockdown, it just makes things different. And, you know, those are ways right now that the Havasupai are working amongst ourselves to try to protect the community. And also because of this lockdown, um, some, I'm gonna call them gems. Um, I turned a field last year, I planted, I am the zucchini queen and I don't even really like zucchini that much, you know? And so I'm like getting into farming, uh, that's cool. You know, that's what supais were known for with our trade route out to Hopi during the harvest time. They would like expect us to be coming with a huge bounty, bountiful, <laughs> beautiful. And, and we were farmers and we're getting back in touch with being farmers. That's, it's a gem, you know, the horses broke in and mowed down like corn, dang it. So I'm gonna try again this year. Um, I've also had an opportunity um, to be spending time uh, with an elder uh, that I've worked on and off with since 2012. Um, I've been able to show I'm a trustworthy individual, a knowledgeable individual and um, him on his own um, had requested uh, some help from me to do some more work. He wants to do more work. And it's, it's kind of what I've always wanted. Maybe it's kind of, it's, it is what I've always wanted, you know, to mo know more about Supai, to know more about where I come from. And I've been able to hear some stories and I've been able to ask a question and I need to ask more, you know, and I'm, and I'm, but I'm hearing, you know, stories I've never heard before. I'm hearing history. I'm being told these things. This is, traditional knowledge. This is sacred to traditional knowledge. This is sacred oral oratory and I'm getting to participate in it. And that is a gem. How many other families out there finally might have this opportunity because, you know, we weren't on lockdown and we could leave, um, get supplies, things like that. Uh, leave, go take a drive. I have not dr turned my car on for months. Oh my gosh. But, um, you know, the Havasupai are successful. There are successful Havasupais out there and we've persevered. And this is how we've persevered during a time of COVID. So, you know, the message that I would like you to take away if you're feeling like this COVID pandemic is overwhelming and maybe it's taken loved ones from you and I wamji maka, I'm sorry for your loss if that's happened to you, but we're going to make it. Oh, we're going to survive. All people will still be here after COVID. And just kind of use this information as an example of how people have persevered through loss and how people are, will continue 
to persevere through loss. And you know that these issues of the institutionalized discrimination or discrimination, these things have always been here. These things have always been here. And maybe COVID is just an opportunity for us to try to bring these things to the surface and try to figure out how to make change. And that's hard, <laughs> making change in the white man's policy and laws. It's hard. And you weave your way through it every day and you make the best of it that you can. So we're gonna make it, you're gonna make it, people are gonna make it. And it can feel scary. And sometimes it is scary. And maybe sometimes we wish for our old lives, <laughs> but we're gonna take this time and we're gonna learn from it and we're gonna use it for our future selves and our future lives. Um, so take care of yourself. <laughs> so we got a couple questions. Um, one from Terry on our Zoom call. Um, they state at the beginning, Ophelia talked about how um, ASU had something to do with um, blood against your guys' permission. Uh, can you expand on that topic? Okay. Um, so the, it's uh, known as the ASU blood case. And um, at some point in history, um, the Havasupai population was small enough that um, the amount of people who had diabetes um, ended up making us, um, because of our small numbers, we had like one of the highest diabetes rates in the nation or, or, or the world. It's a little fuzzy, but so that pushed us up there. And so because of that, um, ASU, their, the intention that came out of their mouth and not the actual intention that they pursued was asking community members to give blood for them to research um, maybe why have the supais had such a high diabetic rate or maybe to help the supai figure out how we might be able to um, fight or protect ourselves against diabetes um, and the intention seemed well right it seemed good um, and, and of course you know um, people are losing limbs people from diabetes people are people were just a lot of people had it have it are having it had it so that was the original intention um, but that blood was actually never used to help us fight diabetes it was never used to help us figure out any of those answers. Instead, it was used to try to prove the bearing land, bearing land um, theory um, and um, other uh, theories of, of mental illness and, and such. And that blood was used to test for other things. It was, and that is the ASU blood case. Um, informed consent, they claim, was created because of our case in suing ASU. And you know what? I was just a baby, I was just a kid. And personally, sometimes my blood starts to boil and I wonder why we didn't keep fighting because we could have set legal precedent, but instead the tribe settled. So out of that, um, we do have some scholarships to the universities in Arizona that some of our tribal members are using to try to better their lives. Another question we had is, um, what would you like to see happen with the Grand Canyon National Park as far as more Havasupai presence and representation? Um, 
It's kind of being worked on, or at least there's a process going. Um, I have had a big opportunity to be a part of um, an intertribal centennial conversation, and a group of Native Americans were brought together to discuss this exact same topic, um, because the 100 year anniversary of the Grand Canyon Park was coming up, and they had released their agenda, and yet, damn, it seemed that there was no Native representation and this group of natives got together and we asserted ourselves and said you need some representation and we made a lot of recommendations so things that i would like to see and this is up to the tribes because tribes for the longest time our information is just put out there by ethnographers no one ever asked if it was sacred or if it was supposed to be public or not and that's just another way that we've um, been discriminated against so and that's the reason why I say it's up to the tribes because what I would like to see is more signage I'd like to see um, native names of of hermit's rest or or um, you know the native name for bright angel trail which, which is and um, things like that, or, or more signage down in Indian Garden. And, and that's going to be up to the tribe on what information, if they even want to work with the park to do that, if they're willing to give that information to the park to be publicly displayed is going to be up to each tribe. But I would like to see just more information. You know, I don't know how many millions of people have been to the Grand Canyon National Park and have absolutely no idea that that have a Supai land, that have a Supais live there right now, and that it was taken from us, or what a have a Supai is. Oh my gosh. Um, so there could be like a little um, brochure or pamphlet, maybe also on these buses, they might be able to have a have a Supai, see if any have a Supais want to go up there and just speak, kind of like be a ranger, um, much like the great Rex Toulouse had done at one point in time. Awesome. Well, we're going to go with uh, two more questions that I got pulled up here. Um, one of them is asking, can you discuss the further importance of land day? Oh, land day? Yep. Um, further importance of land day. We got our land back. <laughs> um, our reservation was only 518 acres before 1975. I was not allowed to walk down to Havasupai Falls. I was not allowed to walk the trail up to Wallapai Hilltop. That was owned by the park. They owned it. They owned us. They owned everything. And when we got that land back, we got that back. I can walk down to Supai Falls. Now we're in charge of it. We have a tourism industry when something like COVID's not happening. It was uh, very... You know, another like words can't describe, but I couldn't even walk down to the falls on my own, on my own, on my own land. And all that was given back. And so um, I think another significance, um, I believe at the time, that was the largest land amount of land that was ever given back, given back to a Native American tribe. Awesome. And one last question we got is, where can people go to learn more about the Havasupai tribe? Yeah, that gets hard, you know, because like sometimes when I look for articles, I just type in the Havasupai tribe and you get Wicca. It's not Wikipedia. The Wiki. Oh, I can't even think of it right now. But it was all it was telling me that my religion was Christianity. I got into that thing and I deleted it. I, I just put like indigenous so it gets kind of hard you know it's just like how they teach you at school you got to be um, aware or know what a good source is so um I like the museum in northern Arizona um I helped work on that new ethnology gallery that ethnology ga gallery is ethical now and it's got good information in it. it's also got information that's approved right how i was saying sometimes we never got a say in what information was put out there it could have been sacred for and nobody would care but the museum in northern arizona 
as a very good, it, it, it was ethical. Uh, tribal members um, from tribes put that information in there. I think that's a good place to start. And then um, the Grand Canyon Trust puts out a quarterly magazine and sometimes there's uh, good articles in there, um, could be informational about Supai, but you know, I gotta tell you, Supais are pretty shy and that, um, you could read all you want from a book, but if you could talk to a supai um, or maybe sit in on one of these conversations that you might see being advertised with the museum, um, you know, I, I would continue to look into that because you want trusted information. You want information from trusted places too. Um, so um, actually the half supai may be of the most written about, but that those are white man's words, colonizer's words, I should say that instead, those were the colonizer's words, and we had no input on it. So if you can find a trusted source um, from a trusted place, um, I, so I would recommend the museum in northern Arizona or a living, breathing Havasupai. All right, well, I just want to say thank you for sharing your powerful voice and powerful stories. Um, Anyone on Facebook joining us out there, just feel free uh, to go on our website um, and look at some of our info. Uh, some of, a lot of that info is important, um, but other than this, Ophelia, do you have any last words? Just thanks for letting me let it all out.